Welcome back to The Line, where we showcase our favorite paintings and the artists who make them. So this evening we're actually going to be looking at Joseph McGurl, uh, who is a Massachusetts-based painter, and uh, we're showcasing one of his pieces called The Snowmaker. Joe is known as a Art Renewal Center living master and um, is most known for his, his landscape paintings and his plein air paintings. Yeah, Joe is um, nationally recognized for his, basically the light effect that he creates in his landscapes. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 that's just a point that he's interested in, how he manipulates the light and the composition. Um, it's something he's extremely uh, good at, as you notice in this piece. Uh, I think he uh, just took an opportunity to create a composition. So as mentioned, the title of the painting is The Snowmakers. So he grew up in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. does a lot of sailing. Hmm. So he, he goes out in his yacht. and So he sailed from uh, Massachusetts all the way down the oh, wow. East Coast. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, I just imagine him being also a skier. So this, mm -hmm. this picture, I'm sure he saw something somewhere and the light was bursting through the snow and he was like, I gotta, I gotta paint that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so he considers himself uh, what he calls a contemporary luminist. Yeah. So I think that harkens back to sort of like Frederick Church and the 19th century painters who were really after that mm -hmm. really dramatic light effect mm -hmm. um, that was new. You know, it was, a new, it was a new thing to be able to understand light that well. Uh, but what he was describing to me uh, about this painting particularly is he was, he was skiing and okay. so he was on, so the, he was on the chairlift yeah. and he had seen something similar to that where the light was, was flowing right. through the snow. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was actually when they were making snow it was just some sort of natural effect. The wind he, like picked it up. Yeah, or something. yeah. and then he he uh, had just imagined the story in a, mm. in his mind that that it was the the snowmakers who were you know making snow mm. on a mountain for mm. you know we suppose skiing you know a ski slope or something yeah. like that. Uh, and so you know <coughs> sometimes when when we've uh, brought people into the studio and they're looking at this painting they they'll miss mm -hmm. the, the little guys right here mm. who are who are you know operating the machine the snowmaking machine. Um, so, uh, you know, you have to sort of take notice, notice of that to mm. kind of understand mm. what, uh, what this piece is about. I actually kind of like that you do miss them the very first time mm. because, you know, the painting actually invites you into it mm. to really take a closer look. Mm. You know, part of that sort of luminous quality of it is one that makes you kind of go, oh, ooh, and you kind of want to like walk right into it to see how the effect was done. Um, and when you do that, then you're like, oh, there's two guys up on the, mm. on the top there. It's as you mentioned earlier. It's uh, he's known for his marine paintings, mm -hmm. and so this is outside of his normal genre. Yeah. But it, it's like I haven't seen him do many in, in this series. So it's kind of like un snow, he, a yeah. Snow just I think it was an idea that occurred to him, and it was a painting that he wanted to do. Um, he's super well known for obviously the coast, the northeast coast. Right. His education was. Uh, figurative based, which is interesting. He studied with a guy named Robert Cormier. Mm. Uh, he did sight size figure drawing. So his approach, what he he brings the sight size into plain air painting. That's mm. kind of his. That's right. He's got a new uh, tool that he has just kind of created that you can buy on his website that allows you to mm. do the the sight size thing. So. It's basically a window that's attached to right. the, to the push on uh, box, right? Yeah. And so he looks through it right adjacent mm. to what he's. Mm. Yeah. But this, I think, would have been totally made up. Right. You know, it wouldn't have been in that. Right. It so. was. That's what's fascinating mm. about this to me, is that he had an idea, he had a concept, mm. and I'm sure he has, you know, some plein air snowscape mm. paintings to refer to, but he understands the way that light works well enough mm. that he can construct the entire environment. The sun is supposed to be back behind that, you know, sort of thick cloud of snow here in the... Um, uh, the left-hand part of the painting, and so he's just he's imagining how where that where that the path of the light is most intense. It's this it's this bright mm. sort of more you know yellow, intense yellow, and then as the as the snow is is filtering out more and more of the light, then it starts to mm. turn this more kind of golden color, similar to I think what you would get at kind of like a sunset effect that is the yeah. lights being right. refracted yeah. through mm. more atmosphere. Uh, it turns more and more golden because the the blue rays are being refracted out mm. and, uh, around it. 
Um, so he's just imagining that. And then, of course, we get a little glimpse of the blue sky, uh, what the day actually must be like. It's not a snowstorm, right? The, right. We're, as the viewer, we're not supposed mm -hmm. to be thinking that we're enveloped in this, this um, blizzard. Right. You know, it's sort of in front of us, and we're seeing this intense light effect. There's a real tradition, like you were, you, were, you were talking about just a moment ago, where um, where there's a lot of the sort of 19th century painters who would do similar things. I know that Thomas Moran was was mm -hmm. a real believer mm -hmm. in painting a little bit out in the field, but uh, he painted, I think, quite often black and white because he didn't necessarily even be, want to be mm -hmm. influenced as much with what he saw, but then take it back and then paint. Mm -hmm the light effect the way he felt he that it mm -hmm. should be portrayed and you know added a whole lot of color and there's a lot of tradition there that I think that he's kind of carrying through and um, holding the baton for. It's such a good painting I mean I was just looking as you were talking about the left corner where the oh, sorry it's in the middle of the yeah that the the wind just knocking that mm. snow out it's mm. so good mm -hmm. yeah. so he's got the transmit light of the actual snow cloud but then the wind hitting that, and so it's coming through it, and he's right. got the cool shadow right, right below. So he's just imagining that, right? Yeah. That all the, all the plains of the hill mm -hmm. and the mountain that are facing more towards our sun, which is being filtered mm -hmm. through uh, the snow cloud, is warmer, and then all the mm -hmm. backsides of those hills are blue because we're imagining the vault of the sky over here, mm -hmm. which is dimmer and darker, mm -hmm. illuminating. But then, if you go up here, right, where the sun oh, uh -huh. is supposed to be thinking that it's, it's, not, it's not being blocked by the snow cloud, you get the you get sort of the bluish snow bank in that upper mm -hmm. right, upper right corner. So it's, it's just okay. And then the the rocks being uh, super dark in the mm -hmm. foreground. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's something that I, I've always admired about his work is I feel like he just uses every form or property of paint to his advantage. Mm -hmm. So. You know, he's using compositional things like, you know, uh, linear perspective. He definitely uses atmospheric perspective, especially with this one where, you know, the, the rocks seem a little bit more um, further away because the contrast is much higher as they get closer. Mm -hmm. He's using linear perspective where th these hills are overlapping the other hills. But something that's um, seen in this one, but also even more so in a lot of his other paintings is, is he actually even uses a textural perspective mm -hmm. where the things that are much closer actually get much, much more deeper in, in texture okay. in how mm -hmm. he actually paints the painting. And um, he just, he's using, he's using the limits of the property of the paint, I believe, in order for you to get this real sense of space and depth mm -hmm. in his work. So, and most of that's shown in this in this painting. Yeah, you're right. I love that. I mean, some of his marsh scenes or his his uh, um, ocean scenes, mm -hmm. you really get sort of the full spectrum of that, where he'll oh, take yeah. the the this really nubbly paint facture to the to the sand and the mm -hmm. foreground and the rocks. Yeah. And but then the water, if it's smooth, it's just painted perfectly. You know, yeah. perfectly smooth. Actually, on the canvas, there's just a really uh, satisfying contrast mm -hmm. uh, to the two. I think you got that from his father actually because I remember mm. talking to him about his he watched his dad use all these different kinds of mm. tools so he talks about he'll just use anything he can to create the texture that's necessary to to have the visual effect mm. so like um, yeah, that's awesome. mirrorless will use um, a feather for the marble oh mm. yeah yeah and for the veins of the marble mm. so he'll use like a sponger or whatever you know mm. to get the rocks and Mm. I think I've even used, seen him use some of those like silicone brushes, you know, that have like the like the seven oh, little tines uh -huh. or whatever, and so it'll just kind of create this like random thing for mm. foreground, mm. midground foliage. Mm. It's kind of cool. Mm. So, whatever works, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Compositionally, one of the things I love about this painting is is there's this sort of like light moment where it's sort of this point of stress mm. in the painting because you've got these huge sort of large shapes in the piece and they're done at these great sort of diagonals and there's like nice sort of ebbs and flows in the piece but there's also like a few accent points which he seems to be really good at you've got like sort of a like one two three which is a number that they talk about when you're using sort of accent moments you know try to create one to three spots and you know in, in this painting i really feel like he's got that and there's just something about this long little sliver of uh stress point which just to me makes it more natural because 
in the randomness of nature, you, you have those moments that um, where things are sort of clustered, and then there's these moments of softness, and then there's other moments where everything's sort of brought into like a real sharpness. Mm -hmm. So I think it does a good job of that. So this painting, every time I look at it, it reminds me of uh, one of my one of my favorite paintings in the Louvre in Paris. It's uh, by Paul Delaroche, and it's Napoleon crossing the Alps. I don't mm. know if you guys know that painting, no, I don't but know that painting. it's. I mean, it's not exactly like it by any means. But there's there's there are these foreground rocks. They're these very dark black rocks with snowdrifts over the top, and Napoleon's Oops. going over it on one of his horses. And then there's this there's this snow. The the wind is blowing blowing okay. snow over the mm -hmm. top. The Delaroche painting is, you know, maybe uh, 20 times as big as this one, oh, and the figures are life size. But it just, I don't know, it just has this sort of recall for me of, uh, of that scene. I wonder if he would have referenced, referenced it yeah, or, yeah. you know, on a video. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I love about this painting is um, how convincing it is, but how, how it's all made up, and mm. just how the difficulty level of that is. Uh, it's, it's so hard when you. Uh, we exist in a world of photography mm -hmm. and imagery and very uh, seldom do we sit down and try to just start inventing something out of our head. And when you do it, you realize how difficult it is. Because mm -hmm. yeah. the limitation of knowledge is where you hit up to a, a brick wall. Yeah. You know? So in order for his creativity to keep unfolding, it's like you know layers of an onion or something. He just, he would have thought about the light effect and then thought about what else is happening and the materials as we talked about, the, the textures. Mm -hmm. and it's incredibly difficult mm -hmm. to do that yeah. and, and to do it successfully. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that he really believes in. There's a really great article on his website, which I would mm -hmm. recommend everybody go and read it, josephmcgrill.com, but it's about that. It's about using your imagination, mm -hmm. observation, and memory to make a piece. Mm. And just because there's, the photos are so easily at hand, I think mm. we just, we default to it so quickly. But mm. he really believes that those, those tools are underutilized and yeah. in many ways uh, have a lot to offer. So um, I don't know, it's something that really inspires mm. me. Yeah. The price of the piece is 15,000. Um, he is such a known painter. I mean, he's really established his, his brand. He's an incredibly prolific painter and, and has become admired by, by many, many collectors. And, um, you know, we're, we're really honored to be able to have one of his works on our show. It's just so good at painting the, that light effect. As soon as you put that light on it, the whole thing turns luminescent. And, and so you, mm. it just really um, has, a, has a deep impact in person. Mm. It's so hard to put a value on 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 work, yeah. I mean, because it's you know it's uh, he's really just one of my absolute favorite contemporary painters, uh, working just from the taste to the technique mm -hmm. to you know what he believes in, and I mean just imagine getting anything, getting a Frederick Church for anything close mm -hmm. to fifteen thousand. I mean it's oh, just man. you know um, it's unthinkable and that yeah. he's. He's taking this tradition and, and building on it. I've seen paintings of his for around, I think around 50, but I'm, I'm not certain. But this is 15, I mean, that's a, I don't know what size, 18 by 24 or something. That's a, mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. about right, yeah. In some ways, it's still mid-career. Mm -hmm. So it's a, Definitely. it's a, an investment too, you know, it's a one that, it's a, he's doing extremely well now with his, tutorial and also with ARC and the, the overlap of he mm. just won like three three awards and so he's yeah. becoming really popular and and so it, it I think he's having a, a resurgence in mm. his career which is a fun thing to, to see mm. just because there was a period I think in the early 90s or you know where a lot of landscape painters were just like it was just like selling mm. everything mm. Did. And so then, you know, you, you, as an artist, I, I even think about this with my work and flower painting, et cetera, is you, you don't ever really go down, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a period where maybe sales aren't as, they don't happen as much, but then they pick up again. And so I think, I, I don't know what his career is like as far as how quickly things sell, but I know he sells a lot. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode with Joe McGurl's painting. Um, we are so honored to have his work uh, this time around, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Line.